Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me good? Okay. So, uh, welcome to my talk, Righteous JavaScript Dude, otherwise known as the thoughts and the challenges of getting more teenagers interested in programming, why JavaScript is the best first language to learn, and how we can influence the next generation. The first title is probably easier to say. Uh, so first off, who am I? Uh, I'm Zach Brueggemann, uh, otherwise known as Brugge Hauser by my colleagues. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a high school student, which is, you know, it's, it's, all, it's meh. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys all have your own experiences, good or bad, you know. Uh, more interestingly, though, I work for DIY.org. It's basically a site for kids where they can earn skills and be awesome. So it's a lot like a 21st century scouts, and you like do big projects, and you post them online, you're in skill patches, you can order them. It's fun. Uh, we're like JavaScript all the way down, so like our front end all the way to our API. Uh, more importantly, though, no, um, I wrote a Doge script that compiled the JS uh, language based on the Doge meme. But I'm not here to talk about that today. That's for Cascadia Doge. <laughs> All right, so first part, challenges. There's a lot of challenges with getting teenagers interested in programming, and I'm gonna go over the two biggest ones in my opinion. The first one is the perception of programmers. Uh, unfortunately, as a society, we have a pretty skewed perception of what a programmer is. We're mostly seen as these people who just like sit in front of computers and type gibberish. I've had like more than I think we actually should, but um, more people like, ask me if I send like zeros and ones to program, and I'm sure maybe others of you have too. I mean, obviously I don't make mind making jokes about it, um, but I, I just don't see how people would think we'd enjoy doing that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't blame them for thinking that way. Uh, <laughs> media hasn't exactly portrayed us properly, so yeah, it's only natural people would think that. As I'm sure many of you know, teenagers are generally influenced more by the media. I mean, sure, some aren't, aren't as others, but yeah, we are. Um, the type of media, of course, has changed over the years. Now, you know, Tumblr, YouTube, instead of newspapers or TV, but it's still there. This doesn't bode well for getting teenagers interested in programming. And the second part is education. Programming, for the most part, has no proper curriculum in high school, and there's lots of high schools that don't even offer it. And I don't think having uh, no curriculum is a bad thing. It means that schools do have the chance to offer a complete, like, innovative course instead of something that a board of educators decide, like, what should be taught to a bunch of students. And I feel that, that non-curriculum-based learning is the best, which is why I work at DIY.org. And these are just some, like, what I was talking about before, the skill patches you can earn. You have, like, back-end developer, front-end developer, noob, like, web designer, all authored by great people, and it's... Yeah, that's why I really like, like non-curriculum-based learning. However, this generally means you have really outdated, like, outdated stuff, and it's just low quality. You know, with you know, outdated languages, overly complicated languages, and things that aren't truly programming. And for some, I really feel it's just a waste of time. And I wish I was joking about Visual Basic, but that is something that was, that's taught in my high school. <sighs> I really wish I was joking about that. Um, I mean, most of these courses advertise themselves as a math science-esque kind of course. I personally believe it should be seen as a creative kind of course. Because, yeah, I mean, you need your basic math skills, sure. But what you really need are problem-solving skills. And at least at my school, as you can see by the description from my course outlines, uh, the course is pretty synonymous with game design. Which, I mean, yeah, game development, it's a great way to get teenagers interested. But it would be nice if more was taught than just that. I really like in that description, though, how its student will learn programming language, like one singular language, if only. <laughs> but it's easy enough to list all these problems. The hard part comes in finding the solution. And thankfully, there's people already working at it. One of the bigger efforts right now is Code.org, which is an organization that pretty much preaches the same ideas I've talked about so far. They've done interviews with other coders and role models, organized teaching material, and are holding the hour of code, trying to get tons of high schools all teaching an hour of programming. This is all, I think, amazing. But the problem I have with it is that all these role models are adults. I mean, nothing against adults, obviously. 
Um, <laughs> but I, I think that, like, it's obviously role models are a great way to reach out to teenagers. But I think it's also a good thing to have, you know, people who are in similar position as you, someone who's, you know, around your age and could actually, you can relate to them. So uh, code.org, if you're listening and like my ideas, please contact me. I will talk in front of a camera for you. <laughs> uh, Mozilla has been working on great efforts, too. There are things like Hackasaurus and WebMaker have been extremely well executed. And I'm very happy that they're able to continue what they're doing. So like Mozilla in the office, I, and I'm um, in the uh, room. Good job. <laughs> So now the next part. Why is JavaScript the best first language to learn? I'll start off with a bit of my own story. The reason that I started uh, with JavaScript was probably coincidence. When I was eight, I started to realize that, hey, someone you know, had to write all these websites and games that I love playing so much. So I went to the library with my mom, and I grabbed the first book that stood out to me. It had some title. I can't remember it, but something like web pages for students. And I assumed that meant elementary students, because you know, students, there's only one type, right? Um, but it obviously wasn't the intended audience, which I found out when I read it again later, was it was high school and college students. Along with the basic HTML and CSS, it taught JavaScript. And the JavaScript was really my favorite part, because I could really command a web page to do something. And this was, I think, just as around JavaScript was starting to become less of like, you know, making something move on a web page, actually becoming meaningful. So here's a good quote from my boss and mentor, Andrew Slowinski. Only two things really matter when choosing a programming environment for kids. Zero to hello world and hello world to woe. And I completely agree with this. It's a good quote. And it completely applies to teenagers as well. And let's see how JavaScript does this and I compare it to some other languages. So the zero to hello world. This basically means how long does it take to set up their development environment and have them write their first line of code. This is where JavaScript really shines, I think. Every modern browser implements JavaScript, some better than others, of course. But um, to teach someone, you just need, obviously, the basic functionality. In the majority of browsers, you can just open up like a console and start trying things out. And if you're on an ancient browser that doesn't have a console, you can just like write in a you know, text editor or Vim if you were that crazy to teach a teenager that. Um, <laughs> uh, but in any case, this makes setup for teaching you know, large groups of students really easy to do because web browsers are everywhere. And the hello world, as all of you know, it's extremely easy to do. Uh, with some other languages, so in case you don't know them, you have uh, Ruby, Python, Java. I don't want to now. I don't. Yeah, I don't want to seem like I'm just bashing on languages. You know, just be like, ah, I hate other languages. But I'm, I just want to compare them in contrast. So the big thing that I think sets apart JavaScript from all of these other languages is that for the other languages, you have to download their compiler. I mean, yeah, you might have to you know download whatever new browser if you want to get the latest APIs. But I'd hazard to guess that every computer a teenager would use has some web browser on it and unless they've chosen to remove it. I don't think many people remove their web browsers unless they worry about the NSA, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, but honestly, downloading something isn't the end of the world, but it's just nice that JavaScript, it you know, just works mostly. <laughs> um, yeah, so the hello, like, hello worlds. We can see here that like, Ruby and Python, they both have their like, easy one-liner. And it's always easy to read, you know, like print hello world, easy. Java, on the other hand, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I just, I don't see how it can be a beginner's language, but uh, yeah, that's a whole nother rant. Um, <laughs> so in any case, though, it doesn't really special matter, or it doesn't really matter what language, since so much of the basic theory across all of these other languages, like all the languages is the same. However, JavaScript's ease of setup is just really an edge over other languages, in my opinion. So that's that. Let's go on to the second factor, hello world to woe. To bring out the woe meter. <laughs> so the first thing I think woe people is websites. I mean, they've lost some of the appeal they used to have back when the web was in its infancy because you know everyone's made them already. 
but it's still one of the, they still make some of the biggest challenges in JavaScript, whether it be on your front end or your back end. And it's, I mean, it's what JavaScript started with, right? So, yeah, and there's so much documentation, my personal favorite being JavaScript for Cats by Max Ogden. Very good documentation if you've never read it. <laughs> uh, the next thing is art. This isn't a conventional usage of JavaScript, but generative art is possible, and it can be really cool. Things like, can like Canvas APIs and WebGL have really allowed for great expansion in this area. And there's so many examples of this. I mean, you see them in Hacker News all the time, you know, whatever new thing. So it's a great like, area for new programmers to explore and to see what, what, what can you do that's like, just cool to look at. Uh, number three is games. Obviously, teenagers like games. And everyone likes games. Um, whether it be you know, casual things like Candy Crush or Dots or whatever, or you know, the hardcore games that you buy for your consoles, people enjoy them. And JavaScript, I think, over the last few years has become a really like, prime platform, finally replacing Flash as the de facto. Uh, there's lots of frameworks that help out with this. My personal favorite is Voxel.js, also by Max Ogden and Substack. Um, it's a 3D engine that's based around voxels. It's super simple to learn because it's, like, it's simple syntax and it's really modularized. So you can have, you have your base or whatever, and then you can just you know, plug in things other people have made, and it's, yeah, I just think, I think that's cool. Um, and I mean, the cool thing at like, game for like, teenagers interested is you know, my, it becomes your Minecraft clone, which, yeah, lots of teenagers enjoy that. <laughs> And my favorite one is robots. Also, we have lots of great talks about these, all right, so I'm not going to go into detail. But with modules like Johnny5 and whole meetups dedicated to Javs or like using JavaScript for robots, you know, node bots, I would say that JavaScript is like the best platform for like getting into robotics. And obviously, there's so many more things that I could talk about. But what really woes people, it's different for everyone. Some may find you know, image processing cool, and some might find you know, like databases cool. Uh, but I think what I find, like the, you know, the woe thing about JavaScript, is that it offers opportunities in pretty much anything you can imagine. And I think that's really cool. And robots. I like robots. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Hello world to woe. So sum it up. JavaScript is the best beginner's language because it's easy to set up. It has, it's easy to learn, and there's lots of whoa factors. Uh, to finish this off, uh, let's just talk about what you can do to encourage a new generation of programmers. Um, if you know any teenagers, convince them to try programming. Even if they're not teenagers, even if you know they're, they're 12, like you, sorry for all picking on you, but. I have a question. Are, are you, are, do you like program at all? Oh, yeah. You do, do you do JavaScript? Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Get them started young. That's the secret. Uh, uh, but yeah, so sh like when you're showing teenagers, show them the cool things. I mean, don't oversell it because then it's just going to become, you know, like, oh my god, go away, old person. I don't care about your code. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, it's fine that not everyone is interested, because we need all the arts and sciences. And, I mean, my friends and I were talking about this, actually, just last night while I was in the hotel, um, like, about these kind of things. And it's like, we, well, I guess I'll go on a little story here, so I've got a little extra time. Um, yesterday, the premier of BC had come to our school. Premier for like Americans, it's kind of like the governor of a state, so kind of like that. And one of the things that she had said was that a high school is like the most important years of your life. And for all of us, we were all like, no. <laughs> I mean, sorry, sorry, she's listening, but sorry, Christy, I don't, I don't agree. Um, <laughs> but like, and especially since like so many of these cool careers that people like the things that get people really interested, they aren't offered in school, and I think that sucks. And I think that should really be changed. But anyway, that's, that's my little rant. Um, <laughs> uh, if you're in a pers position where you can like, you hire people, you control who's employed at your company, I encourage you to help lead this change like, of getting teenagers started now. Um, if you're, you can do it like, on large scales. You can hold workshops and you know, big events, possibly in cooperation with schools. However, 
I think what really counts is doing it on a small scale. Uh, if you have a teenager who wants to actively work with, for you, bring them on as an apprentice. Mentor them where they need it, but allow them to grow independently, too. I can uh, personally attest to this working quite well. I start as an apprentice uh, at DIY, writing some, well, horrible code. This is some of the code that I showed on my resume. See, there's no indenting, because <laughs> my, my reasoning then was that, oh, it's too much work to hit the tab button. <laughs> I wonder about myself sometimes. Um, <laughs> uh, but over the past year, I've grown so immensely in skill. I've written things I would have never done without them. And just like last month, I was hired onto the team. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> and I mean, this is why I really think mentorship is so useful, and that we should be encouraging more students to do things like this, even if it's not in programming, even if it's whatever, you know, I mean, trades are to do it, but you know, the arts and sciences, we should be getting teenagers interested in, in the larger careers now. And if you want to volunteer, you can do that too. Talk to educators if you know any, and try to convince them, you know, about the applications of programming and what you can really do with it, you know, the problem solving. Um, Help organizations like Code.org or Mozilla if you can. And if you're feeling really ambitious, you can start a Coder Dojo. Uh, Coder Dojo, if you don't know, it's basically an organization that helps volunteers run these coding clubs for young people. They're really cool. My only problem with it is that I, when I looked in their map, there's none in Canada. So why don't you get on it? <laughs> I got the Seattle one. You got the Seattle one? That's cool. <laughs> but uh, I think that the end goal is basically, if you come in contact with a young programmer, whether it be you know, online or in real life, try to mentor them where they need it. Mentorship, obviously, as I already talked about, it can be great for both parties. For the person learning, it gives, it's a really personal experience, and that's what I have loved about working for you know, the past year at DIY, because like, my boss and all my coworkers and all those, they've, it's just so personal that you learn so much more that way. I mean, it's, it's a job, so it's cool. Um, and for the person mentoring, I know my like, mentor, uh, Andrew, has said this. It really makes sure that you have to stay on top of your shit. Like, you have to make, because I, you're going like, to have a person you're mentoring ask you questions, and you have to try and get them. And you want to you know, answer as many questions as you can before you get to that point where they already know it or they already know more than you. I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think that mentorship is just really one of the best ways to show off the magic that's programming. So hopefully, you know, turn to Horse.js. <laughs> and that's the end of my talk. Um, if you have any questions, tweet me on Twitter, send me an email, or, you know, say hi to me here. I'm playing the Dev Week tag that I was talking about earlier, too, so use that as a conversation starter if you want. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>